All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. I know everybody's still coming in. It's just seven o'clock now, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. As always, I'm going to try to start off slowly, let people file in. Uh, but really quickly, uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, San Francisco Dharma Collective. And you know this is an, a, a uh, another installment in the Never Ending Sutra. I think at this point we should just call it the Never Ending Sutra, um, Part Seventeen, I think. But nobody worry, you know, every night's a new night in the Dharma Doors. Uh, but we have been working on for some time now this this Sutra, the Akshaya Mati Sutra. It's actually the this guy Bodhisattva. Akshayamati, who the, the word Akshayamati means inexhaustible mind, inexhaustible intelligence, inexhaustible intellect, a lot of different ways to translate Akshayamati, but that's our Bodhisattva. And I, I said this a number of sessions ago that, I mean, if you want to get a feel for the inexhaustible, <laughs> whoo, this is it. It just keeps going and going and going. We could really abandon all other sutras and, and just be with this sutra for the rest of eternity. We could. I don't know how much longer this is going to go on, but this is going to be part three. So within the framework of this sutra, this is going to be our third discussion of these 10 bodhisattva stages. So, you know, just to catch us up, this is a very small sutra, surprisingly, for such an inexhaustible, never-ending sutra. It's a very small sutra, you know, again, that you can find in your treasury of Mahayana sutras. Um, and we've been going through it pretty slowly. We went through the paramitas. We went through 10 practices of each of the paramitas. And then we got introduced to this idea of the 10 bodhisattva stages, these stages of cultivation, stages of development. We spent one night just going through the names of the 10 stages, and I briefly explained each stage. The most important part about that talk of these 10 stages was probably the part where I said that in my own personal experience with these, so Michael, MC, Owens, my personal experience with these has been somewhat of a, well, I feel like I've gone through all 10 several times in a way, and that I go through them, and then I kind of really realize what they're all about, and then I go through them again, and I go through them again, and so what I mean to say is, is that I, my personal experience with these and also my learned, my learned understanding of these things is that they shouldn't be understood as these very delineated stages of progress that one is either in or not in. I'm either a first stage bodhisattva or I'm a second stage bodhisattva. I think they're talking about something a little subtler than that. And that you could think of these as, as I think I mentioned maybe in the first night that we talked about these, you can kind of think of it as that kind of idea of spiraling up the mountaintop where we course through these things once and then the spiral gets a little tighter. And we course through them again and the spiral gets a little tighter and a little tighter. And indeed, we're kind of whirling our way to enlightenment or something like that. But I just wanted to remind you that I had said that before, that in my experience, these are 10 aspects that you, you experience often in a way and then come back to them again and again. So that was the first time, that was the first class. We talked about the 10 stages. And then we, we came upon a very interesting part of the sutra. And, you know, even in all of my experience of 
teaching sutras, reading sutras. This even this kind of caught me a little bit like, wow, wait, what is this? And what it is, it's the part of the sutra that says that a bodhisattva on the bodhisattva path that right before, just before they are about to enter the first stage, right? This, this first stage, this uh, pramudita, this, this great joy stage, before we enter it, we have a vision. And I spent all last week kind of dealing a little bit with the language involved here, that this is kind of weird language, even for Buddhism, to be speaking about visions and indeed even from the language, we're talking about uh, a sight, seeing, seeing something in some way. But what it was last week was about the Bodhisattva just before they are about to abide or enter the first bodhisattva stage, they will have this vision. And here I'll, I'll read from the translation that I'm uh, working on, that they will see within 3,000 great thousand world systems, which is a way of saying all, the universe. It's the Buddhist way of saying the universe. And so they will see within the universe hundreds of thousands of millions of nayutas, like a lot, hundreds of millions of billions of masses of hidden jeweled treasuries. That was last week. And I drew a mural, mural on our whiteboard in a, 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 a feeble, a feeble attempt to portray that vision. That's not this vision, of course. This is the vision for tonight. See last week if you want to have a vision of what Michael <laughs> imagines the Bodhisattva seeing before they abide in the first stage. But you, if you weren't here last week, it's it's very you know important that we recognize this. There's a, there's a progression. Indeed, this is a progression. And then these various visions that the Bodhisattva has are progressive. And what I mean by that is they're going to be building upon each other in a very interesting way. And so last week, I read to the best of my ability, you know, the standard English translation, my translation, and we talked a lot about these jewels. Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism talks a lot about these jewels. And of course, this idea of 3,000 great thousand world systems, which is this interesting Buddhist idea for, um, oh, what is it? A, what is it a Buddhist idea for? The cosmos parallel dimensions, parallel realities. I don't know, but it's definitely this idea about worlds within worlds, within worlds, within worlds. I mean, we are talking about not just a thousand world systems and the, the language of Buddhism of a world system. And by the way, in the tonight's vision in the middle here, this is a little world system. It's got a Mount Maru, four continents, but it also includes the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, everything. And that's just one world system. And then last week we talked about how the Bodhisattva sees, well, this sort of multidimensional reality of some sort in which there is not just our universe or solar system or something to that effect, but there are a thousand of them. And not only are there a thousand of them, but there's actually a thousand thousand. So the, the a thousand world system. Yeah, there's a thousand of those collections of world systems. And actually those, 
the the thousand collections of thousands of worlds yeah there's a thousand of those so that was what we were introduced to last week this really vibrant buddhist cosmology mahayana buddhist cosmology of what amounts to a billion worlds a billion universes uh, again, this is where it makes one wonder, are they talking about like multiple realities, parallel dimensions? Are they talking about, like, what are they talking about? Well, they're definitely talking about a, a very wild worldview in which there are these thousands upon thousands upon thousands of worlds. But then the Bodhisattva before they're about to abide in the first stage has this vision of seeing those billion worlds as being filled with hundreds of billions of trillions of hidden jeweled treasuries. And so last week we talked about jeweled treasuries. <laughs> Before we move on to tonight, to the vision, the vision that a Bodhisattva will have before they abide in the second stage that's what we're talking about tonight but before we go on to that i have to share something with you one of those you know um just uh you know they got serendipity there should be like dharma dipity dharma dipity i'm i'm saying it here so there i had this beautiful dar dharma dipitous <laughs> uh, moment where for some whole other reason, some whole other, you know, thing going on, I, I was reading the holy teachings of Vimalakirti, otherwise known as the Vimalakirti Sutra. And I had reason to dive back into the Vimalakirti Sutra. And I had reason to go back over the first chapter. And if you're familiar with the Vimalakirti Sutra, and of course I've mentioned before that the Ratnakuta, the heap of jewels that we read from on Sunday nights, it's kind of in a family of sutras that includes the, the grand Avatamsaka Sutra and includes the Vimalakirti Sutra. So these are all part of like a family. And, and I've talked about this before about how they're all very deep in kind of a uh, a language of Buddhism. It's a whole world of metaphors that gets used and all of that. And so picked back up the, the Malakirti. And of course, I'm reading, I'm about to read from chapter one. And, you know, chapter one of any sutra is sort of the whole sutra in condensed form. And this is the famous moment it's a it's even within the language of the sutra within the language of buddhism this is called a miracle a miracle of the buddha and what this miracle is that happens in the sutra is when the buddha unfolds his legs and it's like whoa he unfolded his legs and touches his big toe to the ground and thereupon, and so now I'm reading directly from the sutra. Thereupon, the Buddha touched the ground of this 3,000 great thousand world system that I was just talking about. He touched the ground of this 3,000 great thousand world system with his big toe. And suddenly it was transformed into a huge mass of precious jewels, a magnificent array of many hundreds of thousands of millions of clusters of precious gems until it resembled the universe of the Buddha Ratnavyuha, whose name means jeweled array. <laughs> And of course, everybody in the assembly was blown away by this grand vision. 
But it was funny because I had reason to read chapter one and I was like, wait a minute, that's the first vision that a bodhisattva has before they, and of course, at the end of the chapter, a bunch of people in the audience have the initial determination for enlightenment and all of a sudden are like, I want to be a bodhisattva. And so in, what I'm getting at is, is that I didn't even realize how embedded this vision is in the whole kind of uh, scheme work of this, well, not just, I don't want to say Mahayana Buddhism in general, but certainly this family of Mahayana Buddhism. Okay, so I just wanted to share that with you as kind of a recap of last week. And oh, and by the way, of course, let me just finish the recap. If you don't know the Vimalakirti Sutra, you should definitely check out the Vimalakirti Sutra. But the reason why the Buddha touched his big toe to the ground, what the, the cause of this, like why did this happen? And it was because this monk named Shariputra, right? Who, who sort of represents this sort of old school way of being Buddhist, the more hardcore monastic Theravada way, right? And Shariputra had a problem with how defiled the world is, how suffering the world is in that way. And suffering to him, like that he doesn't like the world, it's full of defilement, it's full of all of that. And when the Buddha touches his toe and reveals this hundreds of thousands of millions of nayutas of hidden jeweled treasuries, Shariputra is, is blown away. He'd never seen this, all of these hidden jeweled treasuries. And then when the Buddha lifts his big toe from the ground, the world goes back to the way it was. And Shariputra has this realization that the defilements in that sense were his own mind. And this is indeed what the, what, mm, the heart of my teaching was last week. It was about value. It was about a lot of things, but it was sort of trying to make sense of these jewels within the Buddhist, uh, well, within the Buddhist metaphorical framework. Because of course, these Buddhists are not talking about jewels in that way, right? They're not talking about like earrings and, you know, they're talking about something different in that way. And I talked about this last week, so I don't want to get too uh, caught up in that now. But I really just wanted to share with you how that vision plays out in the whole tradition. Okay. Any, any by the way, any leftover questions, ideas, or comments, or anything about from last week, or just in general, Bodhisattva path, visions, any of this? Yeah, Tanya. Just a quick question. When they start talking about like these numbers upon numbers upon numbers, is it essentially their way of saying infinite? Um, I think the quick answer is yes. The quick answer is yes. The, the not so quick answer has more to do with, it's actually, Tanya, really the, the longer answer, it has a lot to do with, well, what the Buddhists would call calculability, the ability to be calculated. And it's sort of like, and I know Tanya, I mean, you're, I, I don't want to appeal to your knowledge because there's a lot of people in the room. And so I want to try to keep this uh, simple in that sense. Cause I, I know, again, I know you know a lot, but it's about, it has a lot to do with this view of things as being, um, well, calculable. It's like, I can't, I, you know, it's this idea that, right? And so it's only within the world of finite entities and things that exist that they can be counted. And this much more wild Buddhist way of viewing things that is truly incalculable because it is sort of um, non-objective. And it's like, a, uh, so it kind of appeals to that sense. So the only reason why the simple answer is, yeah, it's infinity, but that stays a little bit within the framework of calculability. It just means it's really big within that. 
But to use all of these wild numbers, they're actually trying to push you like outside of that very idea. So excellent question. Okay, everybody ready for tonight's vision? So I have, let me I have a question. Oh, Michael. sweet. Where are you? Hi. I'm oh, cool. Ed. Hey. Hi. Ed. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Ed, it's an all-star night, Ed. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was wondering what they do mean by Joel's by the, you know, the treasure and the jewels. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Um, there's a lot of ways, you know, there's a lot of ways to explain that, Ed, and I'm going to limit myself to two. <laughs> so on the one hand, there's a way in which the Buddhist tradition, the Sutra tradition, they're going to put, how can I say this? Um, well, just quickly, you know, they would say that that a, a, a saying of the Buddha, a truth, a dharma, something that's true, that's a jewel. Then they talk about the Buddha just like, you know, just dropping jewels left and right. And there's a funny, interesting thing about that, Ed, to call a little chunk of knowledge, a little chunk of wisdom, a little chunk of truth. To call that a jewel is a very interesting metaphor because, you know, if you work within a conventional world of value, it's kind of like interesting that, you know, a little rock, <laughs> a little something, people would be like, ooh, so it's worth so much. Oh, it's so valuable. It's so precious, da, 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 da. And then somebody could say, some amazing dharma truth and what the buddhist tradition is saying is is that that little dharma truth is so much more valuable than a little rock and so they're going to completely flip what you think of as jewels what you think of as valuable and redirect your attention to things that are liberative those are precious things that are truth those are jewels and so all of a sudden all of a sudden you start if, if you're invested if I, let, i'm just going to keep the metaphor if you're invested in truth if you're invested in dharma guess what this is ed this is a a treasury this is an this is a vast this is like the fort knox of buddhism there are so many precious jewels in here. <laughs> so I'm trying to do my best to, to play the metaphorical game, which is a, um, well, what the, what the, the a, a very important philosopher that I appeal to a lot, this German guy, Nietzsche, he's, he's problematic, but man, that guy's sharp. And Nietzsche, he spoke a lot about the re-evaluation of all values. It's, it's one of his big themes is the re-evaluation of all values. And he thinks a lot, Nietzsche does, about what we value and why we value it. And he speaks again about this grand re-evaluation of our whole value system. I would kind of like say that about Buddhism, that it's a big re-evaluation of our value system. And so the again, the world that is like, um, well, Ed, I don't, I don't want to say too much about it, but I said this last week was, you know, the reason why we might value diamonds and emeralds and rubies is because they're rare. There's only a few of them. And um, I don't know, iron and zinc, you know, these, these things that there's a lot of, we don't put as much value on those. And from a Buddhist point of view, it's a little foolish to value this and not that. And so what they're going to do again is reevaluate our value system, but surprisingly, they're going to use the language that we're used to. And maybe it's not the language you and I are used to, but it's a language that the world is used to in terms of jewels and luster and beauty 
and even adornments. They talk about bodhisattvas being adorned with these jewels. And if you heard that, if you heard that right now, you might be thinking, so bodhisattvas wear a lot of jewelry? Mm, it's about that they are adorned in truth. They are truth speakers, they are wisdom speakers, they are compassionate, they are kind, and all of that adorns their bodies in a luster that far outshines any precious metal or gem. <laughs> the second thing, that was just the first thing, which is this idea that you could call a little truth nugget a gem. There's that. But there is also, and, and it was part of my, um, and I know no, I know Noam, he uh, they, they put up the, the image from last week. The image that I was trying to capture with that giant mound of jewels, but they're worlds within jewels. And I even made reference to the periodic table a few times in last week's class. And it was, so Ed, this is the second way of thinking about jewels which is not even privileging truth and the Dharma as jewels, but actually starting to see any given phenomena, what in Buddhism they will call any given Dharma, and starting to be able to see any given Dharma like this as a jewel, as a precious jewel in this world. And at first you might be thinking a mechanical pencil is a jewel. And at first it's like, okay, it's not. But if you start thinking about it, and there are a number of ways to think about how this is a jewel, I could write some Dharma with this. I could communicate Dharma, or you could keep going and going and going and realize that the, in a kind of interdependent way, of course, that this contains all of those rubies and gems and pearls and all of that in a, in a kind of an interesting interdependent way that I can't spend all night talking about, but that's another way to interpret the jewels. That it's only a feeble, ignorant mind that limits uh, jeweldom, <laughs> that limits the preciousness to this and isn't magnanimous enough to ascribe jeweldom to everything. So two, two kind of ideas. <laughs> Great to see you, Ed. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Good to see you. Okay, we got it. We got to get to the vision. We got to get to tonight's vision. Again, I said it, I said it at, the, at the beginning that it's sort of, it's building upon last week's vision. And so let me just start by reading uh, let me let me read the standard english translation first this one i don't think is it is very problematic <laughs> it's a little hard to like imagine what's being said but the language isn't that problematic so according to the standard english translation when a bodhisattva is about to abide in the second bodhisattva stage called vimala, pure, stainless. When the bodhisattva is about to abide in that stage, they will first have a vision of a 3,000 great thousand world system. So the same idea of a multifold world system they will have a vision of that multi-world system with its ground as flat as one's palm and with pure adornments of innumerable hundreds of thousands of my millions of nayutas of precious lotus flowers. I I would translate it a little differently just to put a little put to put the emphasis a little differently. So mine, well, in either translation is going to be a little tricky, but Bodhisattva Mahasattva is about to abide in the second stage 
vimala, the stainless. They will first have this sign or see this vision. They will see the ground of 3,000 great thousand world systems, flat as their palm, gloriously adorned with immeasurable hundreds of thousands of millions of nayutas of pure jeweled lotuses. It's, you know, again, they're very similar. The language is exactly the same. I've chosen to kind of word it a little differently. You know, I have certain linguistic justifications for that, but that's the vision. And so the idea is, is that the vision of last week has been, we've upped it a notch <laughs> in that regard. And so we're still dealing with seeing this kind of, um, well, you know, the word is a, a, or the word that gets used is a trichiliocosm, 3000 cosmos trichiliocosm. That's like kind of a made up word to describe this uh, tri sahasra mahasahasra lokadatu. That's the Sanskrit. That's a mouthful. A tri sahasra mahasahasra lokadatu. But it's that idea that I said at the beginning, which was the thousand, but then you have a thousand of those thousands and you actually have a thousand of those groups of thousands of groups of thousands. So we're dealing with that kind of immense cosmos, cos, cosmic idea. And the key to this vision, um, I'd even kind of call it the cipher, because I like to use that language with Dharmadors. The key is this idea that they're seeing the 3,000 great thousand world system the ground of those 3,000 great thousand world systems as flat as their palm. And it's, it's literally what the Chinese says, and it's sort of how, well, it's how the standard people translate it. And it's how I'm forced to translate it because of the Chinese. However, I want you to know that, I mean, it's part of the fun that I'm having. I'm, I'm having so much fun, by the way, like, Dharma doors, all of this Dharma research I get to do, so much fun. And so I'm reading this and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, this, this sounds really familiar. Like, it sounds really familiar. Where, do, where have I heard this before? And then I'm like, ah, Shurangama Sutra. And in the Shurangama Sutra, it mentions this very interesting thing, which is about a, a, a monk, He's considered one of the 10 great disciples of the Buddha. His name's Anirudha, uh, A-N-I-R-U-D-D-H-A, Anirudha. And Anirudha, you know, all of these, um, you know, I, the way that I teach, of course, the sutras and is all of that, is that these monks, they're very allegorical. Shariputra is the brainiac that knows all the lists and all the Abhidharma. Shibuti is this guy that has the uh, emptiness vision that can kind of see emptiness everywhere. Ananda is the young learner, naive. So all of these, the, in particular, the 10 great disciples of the Buddha, they all function very allegorically in the stories. And Anirudha, allegorically speaking, always represents the divine eye. So the divine eye is one of the siddhis, one of the riddhis, one of the abhinyas, one of the super knowledges. And, you know, this is an idea that predates Buddhism. There's a lot of different interpretations of this divine eye. So it, it's a type of vision. It's the ability to see, mm, beings in other planes of existence, they would say, being able to see ghosts, gods, devis, things like that. Um, that's sort of the more traditional version of the divine eye is that they can see these other dimensions. Other ones they can see very, 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 very far. But Anirudha, in the, and this is where it gets interesting, it becomes this sort of, um, a, like a meta story here buried within this story. 
But the story of Aniruddha is that he developed the divine eye, <clears throat> but he had, he had a very particular ability. <laughs> and it gets referenced a lot in the early Buddhist teachings. And what it was is that Aniruddha apparently had, because of the divine eye, he had the ability to observe the world as if it were in the palm of his hand. Um, I don't know where the saying, I got the whole world in my hand. I don't know where that actually comes from, but I know that in 500 BC, there was a, a, a Buddhist monk who was known for being able to go into these uh, trances, you could call it a dhyana, you got a samadhi, but he was able to go into these trances and then be able to observe the world from the vantage point that it was as if it, the whole world was in the palm of his hand. So quite a, a vantage point on the situation. Now, I don't want to, um, I don't want to derail this too much with <clears throat> um, out there, out there thinking or whatever, right? But there is a very famous study of I think it's World War One. It might be World War Two, but I think it was World War One, and it's a very famous study that I've been trying to track down the actual like material of the study. But it was about these soldiers who were shell shocked. They had been too close to explosions. And what they talk about is how their consciousness is disassociated from their body. <laughs> and actually there are these accounts of these soldiers who have their consciousness lodged outside themselves, like here where they are viewing themselves and they are viewing the other person, like from a third person point of view. So consciousness out, like boop, knocked out of the body in some way. And those studies are interesting for at least pointing to the possibility that consciousness is not housed between the ears and behind the eyes, but is a more uh, unlocatable experience that uh, feels like it's happening back there, but that through various traumatic experiences can be revealed to be not happening from that point of view. So that study, which again, I hope to find the actual like uh, material from to stop using it as an anecdote and start using it as a like a actual basis. But my point is, is that it kind of sounds like Aniruddha might have had a very intense version of that where it wasn't just knocked out of his head to the point of view of this, but way, way out. Okay. I don't know, I'm just speculating at that point, again, just sort of like um, trying to lend a little bit of credence to the possibility of having other kind of conscious experiences in that way. Regardless though, it doesn't actually even matter. I told you, I tell you all of that just for fun, truly. It doesn't matter because in my estimation, it's kind of obvious what's going on here, which is that in the old school version, Aniruddha or though the, the, you know, and Aniruddha is an arhat, he's, he's way up there, right? So he's kind of an enlightened being, right? So in the old school Buddhism, an enlightened being could view the whole world which would actually just be um, our world in the palm of their hand. So this is kind of taking it one step further in saying that the Bodhisattva about to abide in the second stage sees the entire 3,000 great thousand world system in the palm of their hand. And so what I'm doing there is I'm trying to make sense of this uh, strange sentence that speaks about the Bodhisattva seeing the ground of a great 
of a trichiliocosm as flat as the palm of their hand. Of, of, of course, I, I've said this in other, uh, you know, Dharma talks that for the most part, of course, Buddhists, or at least Buddhist cosmology is rather flat in, in a, pl a, pl plan a planular, is that a word, pl planular? It's rather planular in its cosmological view to begin with. But I don't think that's what's being referenced here when the Bodhisattva sees the quote ground of a 3000 world system like the palm of their hand. I'm pretty sure it's referencing the classic Aniruddha having the whole world in the palm of your hand. So that's the first one. And I've tried to draw that by the way with little uh, Bodhisattva Akshayamati. He's got the little jeweled lotus world in his little palm, palm of his hand. So that was my attempt there, but this is the actual MC Owens attempt to portray the jeweled, the trichilio, a jeweled trichilio, oh no, sorry, a trichiliocosm adorned with jeweled lotuses. Yeah. The point is, is that they have taken last week's metaphor, which was just a jeweled, Trichiliocosm. <laughs> it's like a billion worlds and jewels. And now they've upped it to where we have a billion worlds and jewels and lotus flowers. <laughs> so we're going to have to talk about that. <laughs> um, so again, the language of the vision, regardless of the translation you read, is that the Bodhisattva will see a 3,000, great thousand world system, a trichiliochasm, basically in the palm of their hand. And then they will see it gloriously adorned or uh, majestically adorned with immeasurable hundreds of thousands of millions of naiutas of jeweled lotuses. So now, now we have three elements to the vision, right? Millions of worlds, jewels, and now our lotus flower, right? So I don't know, I don't know quite where to start. Um, let me let me start here because I don't want to forget this. This was sort of the um, the point of tonight. The point of tonight, was to, uh, I never know how to, to call this, but there's a very, 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 very famous Buddhist mantra that goes in Sanskrit, something like Om Mani Padme Hum. You might've heard about it. <laughs> it's pretty common. It's probably, the most famous Buddhist mantra, right? In the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, you will see it everywhere in pr on prayer flags. You'll see they have the beautiful prayer wheels that you can spin and they say Om Mani Padme Hum on it. And what's, what's great about that uh, technology, the Tibetan technology, is that if you spin one of those, it's like you're saying, oh, money, pad me home, oh, money, pad me home, oh, money, pad me home, oh, money, pad me home. But you don't even have to recite it. You, you can just like spin the technology. It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. <laughs> but my, my point is, this is a very important mantra. Om Mani Padme Hom. Let's, let's start with the easy part. So as a mantra, as a recitation, as an incantation, it has a introduction, which is this om, that sacred Sanskrit bija syllable, sound of the universe, sound of everything, om. And there's also a way in which om is kind of, at least in Indian Sanskrit culture, sort of a, um, and it's an honorific, shall we say, sort of a um, uh, an honorific, 
And what I mean by that is, is that you will often see in a mantra where it's like Om Mani Padmi Hum, the Om is translated as praise or hail or revere. So it's kind of an opener and an honorific. And you will find it at the beginning of so many mantras. So that's that. And then at the end of the mantra is this bija syllable hum, H-U-M. And that is, well, there's a lot to that syllable, but for simplicity's sake, it's kind of a closer, a finisher, a kind of a, a may it be so. That's a hum kind of has this sense of may it be so type of a thing. But the important part of it, phonologically maybe, is that the om is an opener and the hum, notice the lips, the hum, it closes it, right? Om does too, but the idea is, is that these things have feelings to them where om opens and hum closes. And that just leaves us mani padme, om mani padme hum. And the mani, M-A-N-I, is our mani jewel. Now, the mani jewel is, is a particular type of jewel. It's not just a ruby or an emerald or something like that. A mani jewel is a wish-fulfilling jewel. And I'm... Um, there's a lot of research that needs to be done on wish fulfilling jewels. It's a whole uh, world unto itself. It's definitely a part of Buddhism. These things do seem to be at least at some point, actual, like wish fulfilling jewels, like uh, um, uh, uh, fetishes of certain sorts where they were basically like ma magic rocks, but I don't mean to belittle this. I just mean to say that these were understood to be various stones of various sorts that could grant wishes. Some money jewels were luminous. Don't know what they were, but there seems to be these self-luminous uh, jewel gem things that people would make money jewels out of. The only other thing that I want to mention about the Mani Jewel is that if you ever see a Buddha image and he's, the Buddha is sitting in full lotus posture with the hands in the lap, if you ever see a Buddha with a ball or a flaming ball, that's a Mani Jewel, or at least that's a representation of the Mani Jewel. And... Mm, well, at least icon iconographically, that Mani Jewel, it sort of turns that image into a wish-granting image, if you will. So if you have a statue or a tanka or a painting or anything, and the, and the Buddha image, whether it's the Medicine Buddha, Amitabha Buddha, whoever, if they have a wish-granting jewel, the idea is that the energy of that is it's a kind of a wish-granter, wish-granting uh, entity in that sense. But that's all sort of very much an aside. The point is that this word mani is about the about a jewel. And and by the way, this jewel, this mani jewel, I I really don't want, I don't want anybody to get the uh, wrong idea. When I mentioned that these are there's a history of these stones being actual jewels that people were actually seemingly using as fetishes to grant wishes and things like that. I, I don't want anybody to say, well, that doesn't sound very Buddhist. It probably isn't very Buddhist, <laughs> actually. So what I want to do is separate the little cultural history I was mentioning about the history of these Mani jewels. And I want to come back to, well, basically my long answer to Ed. Ed asked about the jewels and I gave the two examples of it. It's kind of about a reevaluation of values. Stick with that one. 
don't, don't worry so much about wish fulfillment. Go back to this idea of the jewel, because that's what the mani in Om Mani Padme Hom, the mani is about this jewel idea that again, I'm trying to articulate regarding uh, value in that sense. And then the Padme, a Padma, this is the Padme. The Padme is the Sanskrit word for a lotus. In, there are actually many types of lotus flowers and they have different names. And I learned recently that the Padme is traditionally the red lotus flower, just FYI on that. But the word Padma is a word for the lotus flower in general. And so we're dealing with that idea, jewel and the lotus. And so Om Mani Padme Hom gets translated a variety of ways. Praise the jewel in the lotus, praise the jeweled lotus, praise the jewel and the lotus, pray, I mean, there's a variety of variations of this and I have heard them all. I have seen them all. I have literally seen images of jeweled lotuses, like where the lotus is made of jewels. I've seen images of, you know, you just see every variation. And it's sort of, um, I think, you know, it's that imagining these things as actually jewels and actually flowers can maybe only get you so far in terms of imagery in that sense until you get too hung up. But let's talk about the Padme because that's sort of the new, that's the new addition tonight. We know about jewels. We know about uh, trichiliocosms or 3000 great thousand world systems being filled with jewels. But what's all of this now about seeing a 3000 great thousand world system in the palm of your hand adorned with jeweled lotuses? Again, if I'm reading this right, if I'm interpreting this right, what does that mean? <laughs> well, whew. again, two things come to mind. <laughs> um, so the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, what this the, the lotus flower. The lotus flower, of course, is like the Buddhist symbol. It's like one of the key Buddhist symbols. Like next to the Dharma wheel, this is like the symbol. And of course, the symbolism of the lotus flower that I've tried to capture here, that, and, and this is, by the way, this is not a Mahayana, like woohoo, out there thing. You will find in the early Pali suttas, the Buddha speaks at length using the metaphor of the lotus flower. And he uses it as this metaphor, which you have probably, you've probably all heard it, but it's the idea that a beautiful lotus flower begins its life actually below the surface of the water in the dark, in the mud, in the mire of the pond but eventually breaks through the surface of that water and then blooms on top of the water. That metaphor is used throughout Buddhism, beginning in the earliest suttas all the way to our beautiful metaphor here of the Bodhisattva having a vision of jeweled lotuses adorning the world. And the metaphor is about transcendence. The metaphor is about that we all begin in the mud and the muck and mire of ignorance and delusion, greed and anger and the world. And we all pop out like what's going on here and trying to figure this out. Some of us get stuck in the mud, some, you know, get stuck down here. But the idea of the Dharma, the idea of, and, and this is a, a metaphor that's used by a lot of spiritual traditions, not just by Buddhism. But the idea is, is that when one begins cultivating, one can transcend the muck and the mire of the world and then bud 
or bloom or blossom like a lotus flower. And that's where you get another layer to the meaning of the lotus flower, flowers in general. So not only are we talking about this amazing lotus flower that breaks through and blooms outside the water, but we are also talking about the metaphor of, of this blooming, which I already mentioned we could call budding, opening, and that is exactly what the Sanskrit word bud, meaning Buddha, it's exactly what it means to awaken, to bloom, to blossom, to open. That's what bud means. And the very, the operating metaphor of Buddhism is that we go to sleep every night and then awaken each morning and go to sleep each night and awaken each morning but there is a way to awaken more, further, higher, and awaken out of this dream that we call reality. And that awakening is called budding or awake, is, is called a Buddha. And one who is fully awake is a Buddha. And so the metaphor for that is a blooming, budding lotus flower that opens outside of the pond. So it's all a big metaphor for this kind of spiritual transformation, spiritual awakening. And then it has this kind of twofold movement of opening and awakening, but in particular, opening and awakening out of the pond. It's why the Buddhists and even the Egyptians, by the way, it's why they really liked the lotus flower was that pristine transcendence of the world or of the muck and the mire in that sense. So that's our Padme. The Padme is about awakening. It's about wisdom. It's about enlightenment. Padme. How about the Mani though? So Om Mani Padme Hom. So if I haven't said it explicitly, I am making a connection between this very famous Buddhist mantra, Om Mani Padme Hom. I'm making a connection between that and this second vision of the Bodhisattva before they abide in the second uh, stage. But I am not saying Aha, I found it. I found the source of Om Mani Padme Hom. It's the Akshaya Mati Bodhisattva Sutra. I'm not saying that. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that the jewel is an operating metaphor in Buddhism, particularly Mahayana Buddhism. The lotus flower is an operating metaphor in Buddhism. And when you put those two together, something very interesting happens. And it is the, it is part of this sutra. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that this whole jewel and lotus thing, it's part of Buddhism. And so the mantra is about that. This sutra is about it. The Malakirti is about it. All these things are about it. And so what's it about? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, this is all interpretation, right? I feel like I feel like I got to say that every now and then, right? That this is all just me interpreting and I'm very, you know, aware of my limitations in that way. So, I'm just telling you what I think maybe might be going on. But if you if you go back to last week's uh, class about these jewels I did a, like, and it's funny because I didn't mean to. It was one of those Dharma talks where I feel like I learned a lot doing it because I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know where these talks are going. And I found myself talking a lot about, you know, value, what we value, what we don't value. And this idea of like, well, in particular, the deluded, ignorant view of like, <laughs> I got all the rubies. <laughs> 
And I'm just like, wait, what? Like that idea that, you know, hoarding these precious gems or whatever is like, it's kind of weird and kind of funny in, in a certain Buddhist way. But I was drawing this kind of deep connection between our normal, conventional, call it deluded, ignorant way of viewing value. Last week, I was kind of critiquing that and saying it's kind of like, kind of silly, kind of weird, kind of lame to be like, oh, the, there's only so many rubies. And so these are valuable and I'm going to gather them all and be better than you. Ha ha. Like, it's like, it's so lame. But the idea is, is that that, that view of value is one thing. And then these jewels that we're talking about are quite the opposite. Like really, really quite the opposite. And what I mean by that is, is that the diluted version of value, it's about hoarding and gathering. The enlightened view of that value is it's about generosity and giving. That was the big message last week is this idea that it, it's the unenlightened person that thinks they're going to be safe and better and whatever by hoarding. And, and then that leads to jewels in the conventional sense and bank accounts and all of that. So that's one way of doing it, meaning this whole life thing. That's one way of doing it, <laughs> that version. And then there's this bodhisattva, so-called, you know, call it a Buddhist way of doing it, which is, oh no, oh no, safety and true value and all those things comes from generosity. Because if I'm generous with my neighbors and I'm friendly with my neighbors, I'll be very, very well protected and well guarded in that sense. Well, who's going to come and get me then? <laughs> if I'm friends with everybody, right? That's kind of the bodhisattva idea is that the person who pivots themselves against everybody else truly pivots themselves against everybody else in that way, in terms of guarding and then having to secure their valuables and all of that. Whereas the, the bodhisattva who's operating in this very other way feels safer the more generous they are, feels richer the more generous they are. And, and, I, and I know that it's just like, you know, that's, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, it's part of the practice to, to look at that and, and to see how, and, and by the way, you know, I always say this, when I say these things, I say it to myself, you know, a lot. And so for me, Michael, it's about being aware of when I fall back into the habits of safeguarding myself you know, say even from my wife in some way. And then having to be like, well, what am I doing? Like, we're truly in this together, like in a, in a very deep way. And so I'm really doing myself a disservice if I'm ever operating from that kind of like me versus her kind of a way. And that a marriage is a very small microcosm for society in that sense, where, you know, not to say that we're all married in that sense, but the same dynamics are at play you know? So those are some thoughts about the, oh, I didn't finish it. So my point is, let me just finish that thought real quick. <laughs> my point is, is that the, the jewel, that has a lot to do with giving generosity, compassion, uh, meta kindness. The jewel is all wrapped up in that and then the Padme is wrapped up in the enlightenment and the wisdom and the transformation. And so you're getting in the Om Mani Padme Hom, in the jewel and the lotus imagery, you're getting this beautiful representation of the compassion and the wisdom that is Buddhism. Because I, and I say this a lot, you know, if Buddhism were just a meditation tradition or just a charity organization, that would be one thing. And if it were just a philosophy, if it were just a science, if it were just a, uh, a system of thinking, that would be one thing. 
And if it were just a philosophy, then that would be like, you know, any other philosophy in that sense. And if it were just a charity organization or just interested in meditation, then it would be just that. And what for me makes Buddhism very special is that it, it is a full respect of how it has to be operating both ways, where it's a very intellectual, smart, inquisitive, don't take anything at face value, question everything. It's a deep about wisdom and enlightenment, but it's also deep heart, deep, deep heart. And it's almost like operating in that level where it's like the heart and the mind in balance in the compassion and the wisdom in that way. And that if you really lose one, it's not Buddhism. Again, it just drifts into being just a meditation or just a philosophy. But to have these two together is really special. And I think that's an interpretation of Om Mani Padme Hom. Much, 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 much more to it, but that might be one. <laughs> Questions, ideas, comments about the jewel and or the lotus? Michael. Yo, Eric. Yeah, just, um, sorry, just quickly to compliment something that you said regarding Padme being in particular, a red lotus flower, it just occurred to me that, yes, of course, because that's the family of Buddha Amitabha, Padme. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, 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 <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So yeah, you're very good comic, Eric, Eric, because the connections keep going. <laughs> can, you, can, can you spell that connection out a little bit more clearly? I didn't quite catch that. Oh, it's just the connection, you know, in the Tibetan tradition, there are these different families of Buddhas. There's these five Buddhas and they have families and Amitabha is the Padme family, but he's also the red bodied one, red lotus flower, deep red lotus connection. And by the way, Eric, I just recently learned the names of the blue lotus, the white lotus. I forget them now, but they have other names and uh, all kinds of other symbolism in Buddhism. Whereas the red lotus flower, yeah, is particular to that Amitabha energy, if you will. Any other questions, comments about the yeah, no. Um, yeah, I was starting to have a little bit of a reaction, particularly when you, but you were talking about the. Um, the, the tendency to, to hoard versus share. And you were talking about, uh, uh, you know, you, your relationship with your wife and noticing it in yourself, you know, with, in the world, even with your wife. And, and I was having this reaction of like, I, I feel like a lot of the uh, examples that had been given so far had to do with like stuff, like, jewels literally or you know just stuff versus sharing knowledge sharing love sharing all this other stuff and then i i want to make sure i heard you correctly that you said that the money the the jewel is sort of symbolic of or or stands for the compassion part of buddhism and the padme for the wisdom wisdom part the lotus for the wisdom part is that what you were saying did i hear that correctly or it's what i said and it's and okay. again, I want to make clear it's an interpretation. Yeah, it's understand, understand those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just love that because the jewel. I, it's it feels to me often in Buddhism like the material examples are very palpable and very easy to talk about. Oh, I don't want to be greedy with money or with food or something. But but is what's what's. Uh, sort of to me more important but more subtle and more difficult sometimes is being greedy or generous with your self with your time with your love with your compassion with your you know so I just wanted to say I appreciate that and I um, wanted to make sure I understood it correctly. Yeah, absolutely you know and I really it is what we're talking about too with like this difference between like what would be called like tangible value value on a stock market or on a, you know, like jewels having innate value in X, Y, and Z 
versus this more, yeah, I know exactly what you just said, where things like attention and compassion could be far more valuable than a, a diamond. And to actually give someone undivided attention or something like that is a jewel beyond a jewel. And I think that the metaphors of Buddhism are talking about that. They want to they wanna be a little more poetic and playful with that. And I know that's not everybody's cup of tea in that sense. And I totally respect that. Of course, the, the Vimalakirti Sutra, Avatamsaka Sutra, and this Ratnakuta, the, the heap of jewels Sutra, right? Again, it's a world where they're operating within a metaphor. And I recognize that it's not everybody's metaphor. So I just want you to know that if like this is not, if it's like kind of like you're not into this, it's like Buddhism school. It's like, oh, you get, we got other sutras then that don't talk about jewels, that don't talk about flowers, that don't talk about that stuff. This is just the more fun, playful, poetic type of Buddhism tonight or this month. Or this year. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, ideas about money jewels, lotus flowers? Yeah, Jimmy, you got it. Yeah, I, I, I really liked that you brought in the Omani Padma Hum as, as being consistent with this vision that's the precursor to this second stage Bodhisattva deal. Because that that those metaphors are they are consistent throughout Buddhism, at, at least in in this in 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 this sort of particular stream of Buddhism, this particular like eddy of Mahayana Buddhism, and the the. Um, that made it really, really, when you brought the Omani Padma Hum into it, I went, oh, bingo, yeah, I know that one. So now this new thing is, is very understandable and very accessible to me. And the, the thing that I really like about um, the takeaway from tonight, this idea of the... Um, one of the, the, the jewels and the values of Buddhism with knowledge, awakening, and compassion being shared rather than hoarded um, is really, really beautiful and really, really right on. I found myself going through some really, really difficult stuff in the last year or so and what was able to make a very soft landing because of the generosity of my friends and community, because I haven't been a dick for the last few years. I've been a kind, I've been, I've been of service, I've been a nice guy, and I haven't, I haven't been an asshole. <laughs> so um, people were generous to me. And I really, really grateful for that. Because I know a lot of people that when they when when the shit hits the fan and they're on their own, they're on their own. They're really, really on their own. And that's a drag. And that's it's it's really difficult to see. And um I'm I'm sure it's really difficult to experience too. So that was that was a really nice reminder tonight. That was great. That was really Right Thanks, on, Jimmy. right on, right on. Yeah, Jimmy, and it's a you know it's a tricky cycle, you know, because you you when you put yourself when you you when you decide to go that other way of self protecting in that way, it 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 sort of it gets harder to open up because you keep investing in that way, and it but it works the other way too that when you start investing what it sounds like you did in being the generous then it pays off in that sense. And you realize the wisdom in that sense. Thanks, Jimmy. So unless there's an, any other questions, comments, or ideas, I did want to 
tie, I got a little more tying together to do. So it's about the introduction of this flower image. So I, I, I mentioned the significance of the lotus flower and flowers in general and awakening and don't, you know, don't forget that. <laughs> That's still at play. But now I want to talk more about the role of introducing the flower image to this. So we're about to enter the second stage of the Bodhisattva. And this is the stage called Vimala. And Vimala is indeed translated as purity, pure or clean. And it's so funny, I have been doing so much talking about this idea of purity. It, it seems to have like, all of a sudden everybody has come to me. <laughs> it's been really fun and funny and interesting. Also, uh, Dharma Dipity, <laughs> where people just keep coming and like asking me about this word Vimala or purity and this idea of purity in Buddhism. And, you know, it's a tricky one because I recognize that everybody's, um, uh, their, uh, what, what, what do I call it? Their, uh, your uh, duality alarm. Like all good bodhisattvas have a duality alarm and your duality alarm goes off and you're like pure duality alert, duality alert. <laughs> like, wait a minute, there's, how could the Buddhists be talking about pure and impure? I thought we're like beyond that, right? And indeed we are beyond that. That's sort of, uh, so I wanna talk about this, that we're about to enter the second stage called Vimala where the bodhisattva is pure. And in particular, just to make it clear, these 10 bodhisattva stages, if you weren't here the first night, they each correspond to one of the paramitas. There are 10 paramitas of the bodhisattva. The first paramita is the, the practice of generosity called dana. And the idea is, and this is the way that I described the 10 stages the first night, that you can think of it as like a ladder true, like a ladder that you would climb to get up to Buddhahood or get up to full enlightenment. And the way that I describe these stages is that they are indeed like uh, the word bumi, what we are translating as a stage. It means like a, a foundation, a place to sit. It's like a solid ground. It's a bumi. And what I introduced the first night is that you can think of each of the rungs of this ladder as being like a station. But what's interesting about that metaphor is that if you are not at that stage yet, and you are not firmly resting at that stage, then that rung of the ladder is something that you would use to pull yourself up so that you could sit on that stage. And so you can think of each of the rungs of this ladder as being one of the paramitas and that we use that paramita, say generosity. We use generosity to pull ourselves up so that we could sit firmly on the foundation of the first boomy stage. That can make sense. And I think it's a very subtle, very Buddhist teaching where the same rung is different depending on your relationship to it. If you're below that rung, then you need it to pull yourself up. But if you were above that rung, you now sit firmly on it. And it's a very interesting thing, that, that difference be, between whether I am below it or above it. And so you can think of each of the paramitas as the rung that gets you up to that stage. Giving is the first that gets you up to the stage of great joy, pramudita, right? And then the practice of shila or shila, moral discipline, not killing, not stealing, not lying, all of that is the rung, the paramita, that gets one up to the stage of vimala, this stage of purity. And I know, trust me, I know how 
tricky and dangerous this language of purity is. I don't want anybody to think that I am not really aware of how delicate it is and, you know, again, dangerous. It's just like, whew, you know, there have been so many terrible things that have happened in history in the name of purity that it, it, it's worthy of being afraid almost of that term. But I'm also sort of like not ready to abandon it entirely because, you know, the, what I mean is, is that this word vimala, purity, within this tradition, particularly in this tradition that we're talking about tonight, I mean, I mean, it's hard because, you know, another thing that I find myself um, talking about a lot is, well, call it the morality of emptiness. I find myself discussing that topic a lot. That is, which is if everything is empty and there's no such thing as sentient beings and everything is like a dream or an illusion, then why morality? Why ethical behavior then? If everything is an illusion, if everything is like that, why morality? And I get that. And, you know, I think that that's, it's a, it's a totally legitimate question, but what I'm, what I'm getting at is it, you know, Buddhism is not nihilism. It's not nihilistic at all. It's nowhere near it. It's, it's an incredibly moral tradition, you know, founded on moral discipline in that way. And I, I basically, I want to basically say that what Vimala is talking about is a kind of moral purification, but because this is the Bodhisattva path, and they have they use this very special word Vimala, that means like stainless, basically like without a blemish or without a fall uh, flaw, like totally perfect, and I mean to give you there's so many ways to talk about this and I don't want to belabor the point too much, but the Bodhisattva at this point, in terms of being flawless or stainless, it's the kind of idea, well, it cuts two ways. One way that it cuts is that, you know, the Bodhisattva who has really taken the vow of being a bodhisattva very seriously and is truly, truly invested in all sentient beings' enlightenment in that way. There's a way that the idea is, is that the bodhisattva who's about to reach this second stage of moral purity, vimala, they're, they're basically like incapable of telling a lie. And what I mean by that is, is like, it wouldn't even cross their mind to deceive somebody. They wouldn't see an advantage in it. They, it, just, it just wouldn't even come into the realm. And what they're kind of describing is that the Bodhisattva that's about to enter the second stage is kind of getting to the point or at the point of Vimala is at the point where they are almost incapable of a unwholesome, to use the language of Theravada Buddhism, incapable of an unwholesome act. Along with that, and this is where it's going to get a little tricky, but I just need to say this because it's, it's very much a part of the, the process. Because there is this idea in Mahayana Buddhism, there is this idea of upaya, or skillful means, you know, and I mentioned the, the Malakirti Sutra at the earlier, which is like all about this idea of upaya or skillful means. And it, well, let me be, I'll do that. I'll play it safe and I'll just use Vimalakirti as an example. So the Vimalakirti Sutra is about this. He's not a monk. He's just a, he's a householder, has a wife, has kids, has a job, all these things. And in particular, he's sort of everybody's best friend. He's like a very friendly person in the neighborhood in that way. And he even, 
He even goes to the local bars and talks to people about the Dharma. Now, within the very rigid early Buddhist tradition of monasticism, it would be entirely impure for any Buddhist to go into a bar. It would just be de facto impure. It's an impure place. They sell impure things there. There's impure activities. There is no reason for a pure Buddhist monk or nun to be going into a bar. How I understand Vimala, the second stage of the Bodhisattva, is this idea of like, yes, they're basically at a point of moral impunity, if you will, that they're kind of incapable of doing kind of a morally questionable act in that way. But even more importantly, to or to the point, I believe what Vimala means in terms of stainless or flawless, it means that the Bodhisattva at this stage who goes to a bar, chats with people about Dharma and, and spreads those jewels, that that cannot be considered an impure act. That it's Vimala, it's flawless. Even though it might look like it was flawed because they went into an unwholesome establishment, because of the intention, because of the Bodhisattva path, it's not, it's not a flaw. So that's how I understand Vimala as it pertains to the Bodhisattva path, is that there is an actual transcending of rigid senses of morality. And it becomes much more, um, well, you know, it's, uh, what do they say? The spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. That's what we're talking about. The Bodhisattva acts within the spirit of the law. The early Buddhist tradition that's very hardcore monastic, it's the letter of the law. If the Buddha said, don't touch flowers, don't touch flowers. If the Buddha said, don't do that, don't do that. The Bodhisattva path is more about, but didn't he mean, <laughs> when he told us not to do, didn't he mean, <laughs> it's, that's that, <clears throat> that idea. Um, I, went, I went off on that too long. I don't even know what that was. <clears throat> but I wanted to mention very quickly, the introduction of the flower image in this vision. So we had the worlds. And we had the jewels before, but now we have the world adorned, not just with jewels, but with jeweled lotuses. It's, it's way too late for me to actually start talking about this. So I just want to suggest <clears throat> the thing about flowers in Buddhism is um, what's being introduced here is a very organic metaphor, first of all. So the minerals are very like, I don't know, that's one thing, but a flower is a living organism. And in particular, well, oh, it's so many things actually. Oh, it's so many things. And so many things I wanna tell you about. There's a beautiful Japanese Buddhist expression um, I forget the poet. It was a Buddhist poet in the early 20th century. I can't remember his name. I feel bad. I can't remember his name. He's very famous for this um, uh, sentiment. And the sentiment that is a Buddhist one that he kind of popularized. Oh, what was his name? Apologize. But the Japanese expression is mano no aware. Mano no aware means the sadness of all things. And the premier example of mano no aware is the cherry blossom. So Japanese culture, of course, is, is they love the cherry blossom, right? And what's going on with the cherry blossom, of course, if you don't know, is that it is this 
extremely <laughs> small window, <laughs> like an extremely small window of time in which these blossoms, these cherry blossoms bloom. And in particular, Mano no Awadi, it speaks about, it's this almost like an, an aesthetic movement in Japan that this one poem, this one poet that I can't remember his name. And it has to do with how things would not be as beautiful if they lasted forever. It's the, the sadness of all things that we kind of, it's this, and it almost like makes me cry thinking about how how that works in a way. And I say that because this flower metaphor, even though I talked about the significance of the lotus flower, I want you to just think about flowers in general. I want you to think about their beauty, their colorfulness. I want you to think about their fleetingness, that they do not last forever, that they wilt, and there's something about that wilting. And and in addition to that, I want you to think about the beauty, ephemerality, and the flower's relationship to the whole organism. Like, so what I'm getting at is, is that if, if last week, if last week I tried to convince you of how this is a jewel, this week I'm trying to convince you of how it's a jeweled lotus, in terms of its ephemeral fleetingness. This is about anicca, about impermanence in that way, but it's about looking at everything now as this wild, like, like, uh, oh, yeah, it's like, it's just this wild way of looking at everything as like a little flower bud on the tree of life or the tree of the world. Right? <laughs> and not just beautiful flowers, but little jeweled flowers coming in and out of existence kind of a thing. Again, I, I, I told you this at the beginning that this is where this sutra, this moment of the sutra is where we get very Jungian archetypal in dealing with these kind of beautiful images. And so it's, some, it's, a, it's, it's something that you put on and, and see how it feels in that sense. Right. So it's like if, if you if you don't get it, it's not something to be got like that. It's it's more like poetry in that way or jazz music, let's say. <laughs> so all right. I've I've already gone over. I'm totally up for answering any last minute questions, comments, answers, ideas, or hearing any epiphanies. Okay. Then on that note, I apologize if I went a little long, got too excited, <laughs> the jeweled lotus flowers everywhere. But thank you everybody for being here. <laughs>